Well, glory to Jesus Christ. Today, as we celebrate the title of Mary, the Blessed Virgin, Mother of the Church, because she's Mother of God incarnate, she's Mother of Christ, she's Mother of us all, Mother of all believers. And also, that image of Mother, there's also the image of her as a sister in the faith with us, in, in uh, our following, as she is the leader of a leader in so many ways of the disciples, a great model for us in prayer and in devotion to Christ. Let it be done to me according to your word. <clears throat> Behold the servant of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. And we are, uh, you know, starting today. We're ha we have the, uh, because we're starting up the masses slowly, the public masses, uh, I won't be doing the hour-long thing, Mass, on Facebook, but I will be doing the Mass, but it'll be about a half hour. But uh, other people said, well, we want, you know, doing the day, the Saints of the Day and some other catechism stuff and, and uh, a scripture, a meditation on scripture. So I'll be doing that too. That'll be separate, but you know, chances are you won't get it live because I'm going to do it whenever I get the opportunity to do it. Uh, I hope to do it daily. But uh, so we have that. That'll probably in the morning and I'll also do mid morning prayer with that sometime in the later morning. But maybe earlier in the morning, maybe in the afternoon. But I will still have the mass. But the mass is not at nine. Now, if you want your quote unquote live, it uh, Eastern Standard Time here in the United States. But 8.15. So it'll be 8.15. And it'll be a half hour because of the nine o'clock uh, live mass uh, three times a week. But anyway, which at this point has to be done by res uh, you. Uh, the, the Sunday Masses have to be done by reservation, both the English at 10 o'clock Sunday Mass and the uh, Portuguese Mass at 7 p.m. on Sundays. But our weekday Mass is on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and so we'll have that. But people have to sign in for that because uh, in case there's a, a case of corona, not the beer, mind you, a case of corona that shows up uh, among people who are in the church so that we can contact everyone. So, but I'm doing this daily mass on, at 8.15 on Sunday, on uh, weekdays, and uh, for a bit anyway, on Sundays also. And we'll have the 2 p.m. thing that we have here. The, the, you know, today we have themes in the catechism, which is on prayer. And on Wednesday we have the spiritual reading from Thirsting for Prayer by uh, Father Jacques Philippe. And uh, Tuesday, that's Wednesday rather, Tuesday we have the Bible study, which is on the, the Epistle of James. And uh, Sundays we have the Office of Readings at 2 o'clock with the homily there. And Thursday we UCAT, the Youth Catechism, and Friday Bible Devotions. So And Saturday we'll have Evening Prayer at 4 p.m., followed by adult uh, catechesis, the catechetics from the catechism also. So let's say a prayer to the Holy Spirit in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that, by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we're in our catechism study. We're on the Psalms, which in, uh, we're in... Um, the Christian prayer section, uh, paragraph 2585. So, and uh, we've touched on this a bit last time, but the, the Psalms 
they're traditionally, most of them are traditionally ascribed to David. But they're the hymn book of the Second Temple. And this praying the Psalms, you go through the whole gamut of human emotions. And many of the Psalms, as we prayed them, we interpreted them allegorically, uh, rather than, uh, you know, like the uh, deprecatory Psalms, the cursing Psalms, uh, that uh, the attitude is not exactly Christ-like. Uh, but this is the inspired word of God. So we interpret this in the light of Christ, in the light of Jesus is Lord, in the light of God is love, our two uh, scriptural uh, verses or portions of verses, one from St. John and one from St. Paul, that uh, we interpret all the scripture and apply all the scripture. And so the Psalms, or the Psalms are the, they're the, the prayer book of the church. So they're the basic, in all the rites of the church, of the uh, divine office, what is called the divine office, the liturgy of the hours. Of, of morning prayer, evening prayer, night prayer, all these daytime prayer, midday prayer, all of these the traditional offices in the in the Tridentine uh, use, as well as in our uh, Vatican II use, but all the other rites too. The Psalms are so so crucial in prayer, and in the our sister sisters in the faith, the uh, very. Many Protestant groups, the Protestant groups through the Psalms are very important. Uh, the Anglican tradition, the Psalms, praying the Psalms, morning and evening prayer and other things. The Lutheran tradition, the Reformed tradition, singing the Psalms, even doing the Psalms in a, a paraphrase, singing them in a paraphrase that was very much associated with the Reformed tradition. And so we pray. So, so 2585 tells us, from the time of David to the coming of the Messiah, Texts appearing in these sacred books show a deepening in prayer for oneself and in prayer for others. Some of the Psalms actually may well antedate David, often a good while. Some there's one that uh, they, they discovered in Ugarit. The Psalm seems very much like this Bronze Age uh, hymn of praise to Dabal. So and. Uh, Psalm 103, some may make uh, parallels to that, to the prayer, the, the hymn to the son of Akhenaten, uh, but uh, that's all speculation. Uh, anyway, but they, they, many of the Psalms are probably very old, older than uh, before the time of David, which was around the year 1,900 900 or so uh, BC. And, but Psalms were composed uh, beyond that, uh, it said, from the time of David to the coming of the Messiah. And so, and it says, they show a deepening in prayer for oneself and in prayer for others. There are also canticles throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, hymns such as in the New Testament, the Magnificat, the Canticle of Mary, the Canticle of Zechariah, the Canticle of Simeon, you see that, and then various other things. It, and even seems to be uh, quotings from hymns. St. Paul seems to be quoting from hymns that were popular in his time. And canticles throughout the other, so many of the other books of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, including uh, the, uh, the hymn of Moses and the hymn of Miriam, Canticle of Miriam, which seem to be very ancient. And uh, so it says, so it shows a deepening in prayer as we approach these, as we pray these things uh, within our, with our feelings, uh, identifying the feeling with the, uh, the laments of the person, the various other uh, the problems the person has, the, the different feelings, not just the positive ones, but the negative ones that can help us. Uh, a deepening in prayer for oneself and prayer for others. So we pray these Psalms not just for ourselves, we pray them for others. And we also, in the Psalms, see prophetic fulfillment, that Christ fulfills so many of the Psalms, and, and the Church fulfills many of these Psalms. Uh, and we see the Lord working in this. So we need, the Psalms are to be, be, to be approached as prayer, and Scripture needs to be approached as inspired, the inspired uh, written Word of God. 
and, of, and uh, the use of the very tools of the uh, uh, Geschichten, the uh, uh, critical analysis of it, historical, linguistic, uh, literary uh, tradition, all these, these things can be very useful. But they're tools, they're not ends in themselves. Because we always remember that scripture is the inspired word of God. And ultimately the love letters of God to us. And so it says, Thus the Psalms were gradually collected into the five books of the Psalter, or the praises, is what they are called. Uh, the, uh, the, is it halalim? Is that the plural of it in Hebrew? The uh, masterwork of prayer in the Old Testament. The Psalms both nourished and expressed the prayer of the people of God gathered during the great feasts at Jerusalem. So there were these Psalms, the Psalms of Ascent and these other things that are associated with the, the particular feasts. Some that have a Passover, the deliverance from Egypt theme, various other themes like that are tied from growing up. There, there were the coronation, the enthronement Psalms that were probably used when the king was, was uh, enthroned there in the uh, the uh, Solomonic times and after, and uh, there are uh, all different types: individual laments, group laments, praises of all that. In fact, they are often called the praises, as as such. As I said, the hymn book of the Second Temple. It's still the basic hymn book of of the church. The Psalms both nourish and express the prayer of the people of God gathered during the great feast at Jerusalem and each Sabbath in the synagogues. As, as the synagogue developed more and more and became, you know, the temple was still the main place of worship and the sacrifices, the, the main expression of worship. But there were all sorts of other things and the Psalms were used there in the temple and and then they began to be used in the synagogue, synagogue meaning a meeting place where people would come together for instruction, for, for prayer, and various other thing, things. So it, it, as assembly, coming together as, as, in, in assembly. The uh, synagogue was often called the, you know, the Beit uh, Knesset, uh, the house of the, uh, the gathering of the assembly of the, of the people uh, there. And uh, uh, so their prayer is inseparably personal and communal. So prayer should be personal. All prayer, including the public or the liturgical prayer. We should be praying it personally invested in this prayer. But also that it's communal. And especially when we pray scripture and we pray the, the prayer of the church, which is objectively the highest form of prayer. And uh, with the mass being the highest form of the highest form of prayer, there the mass and sacraments, and so uh, so we pray this together, even when we're praying alone. So when I pray the office alone, I'm praying with everybody else who's praying the office. I'm praying with everybody in the body of Christ. Every and it's true of all of our prayers. We never pray alone. We're always praying with others. And uh, there was someone I knew who said, but uh, you know, even if the saints were conscious, which this person didn't believe, he said, I don't want them praying for me. I don't need it. You know, they, I, I, I want people on earth to pray for me. And I said, well, they're praying for you, whether you like it or not. They're praying with you. We're all united. We're all united. I'm praying with people who, uh, and, and I said, you, this particular person didn't think that I as a Catholic was, a brother in Christ, actually. But I said, uh, uh, I'm praying with you, I'm a prayer partner with you, whether you like it or not, because I am in Christ, which he denied. He said, I wasn't in Christ, I wasn't a member of the body because I was didn't belong to his particular theology and sect and all that. Uh, but anyway, I said, we're still, we're still the family. I said, still, we still have the spiritual DNA that so much you have at least 80% of Catholic DNA. So, uh, but anyway. We are to pray as the people of God, praying together. We're always pray together. We're always united in prayer with those who, go, who are 
connected to us by God's grace. It concerns both those who are praying and all men. So we don't just pray for our own intentions or even the own intentions for our particular congregations, but for all people, all people, for their needs. The Psalms arose from the communities of the Holy Land and the Diaspora. That's the scattering of the, the people who weren't in you know, Eretz Israel in the Holy Land. Uh, uh, they had gone out after the exile. Of course, the large numbers of people were in Babylon and, you know, further east even. And uh, then, you know, through trading and various other things, uh, there were community, Jewish communities, uh, Israelite communities first, but uh, Jewish communities then uh, throughout their, their known world. And so they were called the scattering, the diaspora or diaspora. So this, this, the Psalms as prayer sort of embrace all of creation. Their prayer recalls the saving events of the past. It extends into the future, even to the end of history. It commemorates the promises of God already kept and awaits the Messiah, as I said, so much of the Psalms. We as Christians, when we read it, we see Jesus there. So when Jesus on the cross quoted the psalm, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He, I believe, really felt that, really felt abandoned by the Father and the Holy Spirit and even by his own own nature and own his own uh, person, because God, he felt this abandonment, but uh, which was not true, because the Trinity was with him, and of course he was... A united person, uh, but uh, he really felt but that that also was a messianic psalm that he was fulfilling in that. So, uh, so the psalms remain the essential essential prayer to the prayer of the church. At mass, we have psalms. Uh, we have a portion of the psalm and uh, the responsorial psalm and and our Vatican II rite. And we have portions of Psalm and introits and, 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 and uh, entrance antiphons and offertory antiphons, communion antiphons, uh, all sorts of things. And the Psalms are in, in different places throughout the liturgy. You can see uh, uh, references to them uh, in some way in, in many of the colics and other things. There are uh, references to Psalms and scripture uh, in, the, the, let's say, the Eucharistic prayer. The, References to, to references there to scripture. So in Jesus, we have to remember Jesus prayed these psalms. This was his prayer book as well. So it says the Psalter is, is the book in which the word of God becomes man's prayer. With our feelings, all of these other things. In other books of the Old Testament, the words proclaim God's works and bring to light the mystery they contain. But the words of the psalmist sung for God both express and acclaim the Lord's saving works. The same spirit inspires both God's work and man's response. So we cannot respond to God except by God's grace, except by God's initiative. And we cannot persevere except by God's grace, except by God continuing his initiative. Christ will unite the two. In him, the Psalms continue to teach us how to pray. The Psalter, this is 2588, the Psalter's many forms of prayer take shape both in the liturgy of the temple and in the human heart. <coughs> and today still, both in the liturgy of the church and in our feeling, our prayer of, of, of our feelings, our prayer of it, so how can we can identify with what the psalmist was feeling or what the psalmist was going through. <clears throat> Whether hymns or prayers of lamentation or thanksgiving, whether individual or communal, whether royal chants, those enthronement psalms and things I was mentioning, songs of pilgrimage, I rejoice when I heard them say, let us go to the house of the Lord. I remember we uh, went to Jerusalem on the pilgrimage, and it was a, an interfaith pilgrimage, uh, Jewish and Christian and, uh, you know, Protestant or Protestants and Catholics. 
And so we stopped at this particular uh, height, just above Jerusalem. And you look down, you could see Jerusalem, the old city, and you could see that the Dome of the Rock, the uh, uh, you could see so much of the spires of the churches and all that, the, the, the minarets, the mosques and stuff. You could see that. And uh, a rabbi who was with us led us uh, in Hebrew. He prayed it in Hebrew, the, these prayers, these pilgrimage, some of these pilgrimage psalms there as we had come to Jerusalem. And so, uh, or wisdom meditations like, the longest psalm, which is uh, 119, according, according to some, uh, depends on what your, what diversion you're using, if the Septuagint numbering or the Hebrew numbering. The Hebrew numbering, I believe it's 119, and 120, I think, is the Septuagint. But, and it's divided into uh, Hebrew letters. There's Hebrew letters, each section. And... Uh, we often use this in the, the Vatican II, right, in, uh, in um, um, afternoon prayer. We have, or, or noon prayer, I should say, midday prayer, which doesn't have to be at noon. But anyway, uh, that's often used on, on the law, the Torah, on, on that. And in wisdom, there are other wisdom psalms also in this collection of the 150. The Psalms are a mirror of God's marvelous deeds in the history of his people, as well as reflections of the human experiences of the psalmist. Through a given psalm, many may reflect an event of the past. It still possesses such direct simplicity that it can be prayed in truth by all men of all times and conditions. Certain constant characteristics appear throughout the psalm. This is 2589. Simplicity and spontaneity of prayer. You can see that it just uh, springing out from the feeling of the person. The praise, the thanksgiving, the lament. The desire for God himself through and with all that is good. That we, uh, The thirst for God that the psalmist often has and expresses. Through and with all that is good in his creation. The distraught situation of the believer who, in his preferential love for the Lord, is exposed to a host of enemies and temptations, but who waits upon what the faithful God will do in the certitude of his love and its submission to his will. The prayer of the Psalms is always sustained by praise. And that's true, and it should be true in our prayer, which should always be lifted up by the praise of God, no matter how we feel, and thanksgiving, no matter how we feel, in all of these, these things. Because remember the, that fourfold relations, fourfold relations of prayer. Adoration, which, which is, as prayer can only be given to God, and uh, A-C-T-S, adoration, contrition, for our sins, which isn't just sorrow for sin because I got caught or because this is going to have bad repercussions on me. No, be sorrow for sin because of uh, going against the love of God, uh, uh, harming others, harming oneself. Uh, contrition for that. <clears throat> and T, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving in all situations. Thanksgiving even for the hard things. Because God is going to use it. God is going to use these things. So we thank God for everything. And supplication. We're praying for our needs and praying for the needs of others. And these... Uh, these things you can see throughout the Psalms, these, uh, f the, these four uh, modes of prayer. Certitude of the love and submission to his will. And all that. No matter what they go through, often the Psalms will end with, I, yes, I trust you, I know you're going to do well, but not always. 
The prayer of the Psalms is always sustained by praise. That is why the title of this collection is handed down to us, is so fitting, The Praises. Collected for the assembly's worship, the Psalter both sounds the call to prayer and sings the response to that call. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What is more pleasing than a psalm? We're told by St. Ambrose. The psalm is good, so I'll just praise the Lord. It's a confession of faith and song, he tells us. And so, in brief about the Old Testament reality of prayer, this is 2590. Prayer is the raising of one's mind and heart to God, or the requesting of good things from God. So it's actually the raising of the mind and heart by God's grace that we participate in that. God tirelessly calls each person to his mysterious encounter with himself. Prayer unfolds throughout the whole history of salvation as a reciprocal call between God and man. The prayer of Abraham and Jacob is presented as a battle of faith, marked by trust in God's faithfulness and by certitude in the victory promised to perseverance. The prayer of Moses responds to the living God's initiative for the salvation of his people. It is foreshadowing the prayer of intercession for the unique presence of God. The prayer of well, was the prayer of intercession of the unique mediator, Jesus Christ. So Moses is a foreshadowing as intercessor, as mediator uh, with God of Jesus Christ, who is our one mediator with the Father and our great intercessor in whom we place all our intercessions as we join, as we intercede for each other, as we pray for each other, this in Christ. The prayer of the people of God not flourished in the shadow of the dwelling place of God's temple presence on earth, the Ark of the Covenant in the temple. The Ark of the Covenant being a foreshadowing, we see of, of, of Christians, Catholic Christians especially, seeing Mary as that. Not only the new Eve, but the Ark of the Covenant. And so when they see the Ark of the Covenant brought up into, into heaven in the book of Revelation, it's in the context of the Mary figure, who brings forth the one who will rule the whole world with the rod of iron. And who is that? Who only can that be? That's Jesus. Who's the mother of Jesus? Mary of Nazareth. Mary, mother of God incarnate. And so right after that, it's that they see the ark and the temple. So this uh, is this uh, is fulfilled in Mary. Mary is the ark who carried Jesus, the bread of life, who carried Jesus, who is the, the new law of grace himself, who is the, the new rod of Aaron, that's there, of the power of the Lord of Miracles. And so we see that, uh, attended by the, the cherubim. So the Ark of the Covenant there, it had, you know the Ark of the Covenant, it had the statues, of, and uh, to some of my uh, fundamentalist brethren, or, and uh, uh, yes, statues, religious statues that God commanded to be made. And he didn't say, well, just make these and, and never make any others. No, he didn't. In fact, he had them make this strange religious statue of, of the brazen or bronze serpent, which Jesus said uh, prefigured him, was a symbol of him. So we still have symbol, artistic symbols, representations of Christ, especially since God had become incarnate. That. So, so to say you can't make a picture or a statue of Jesus or that they, they shouldn't be honored the way you honor the flag or you honor these other things, uh, that's sort of, in my mind anyway, not accepting fully the incarnation and the, that Christ also redeemed all of creation. The, the physical world is to be used to praise God as it was in the Old Testament. Incense, all this, the oil, all this stuff. Still, still using that in praise and worship of God. So the so under the guidance of their shepherds, especially King David and the prophets, the prophets summoned the people to conversion of heart 
And while zealously seeking the face of God, like Elijah, they interceded for the people. Again, that prophetic, part of our prophetic vocation, as well as our priestly vocation, and indeed our royal vocation, like King David, is to pray for one another. Praying for one another. We are commissioned in baptism to be people of prayer. And that's intensified in confirmation. So we're to pray for each other. How often that's asked for in the New Testament. Pray for me, pray for us. The Psalms constitute the masterwork of prayer in the Old Testament. They present two inseparable qualities, the personal and the communal. They extend to all dimensions of history, recalling God's promises already fulfilled and looking for the coming of the Messiah. Prayed and fulfilled in Christ, the Psalms are an essential and permanent element of the prayer of the church. They are suitable for men, that is, men, of course, almost, in fact, every use I've come across so far with it, that I can recall in the catechism, it doesn't mean just adult males. It means the human race. And man means usually an individual human, not just an individual adult male, or the whole human race. So now we're in the New Testament part. I'm sorry if I went over the Psalms uh, again, because I had done a bit of them last week, but uh, did, you went over it again, but I thought it was so so useful, so worth doing again. So, so this is Article 2 in the, this section on prayer, or Part 4, in the fullness time about the New Testament. So this is 2598 if you're following along in your catechism. The drama of prayer is fully revealed to us in the Word who became flesh and dwells among us. That's Jesus, the eternal Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this image of the Word uh, being spoken by the Father eternally is this, this image of, of uh, Jesus coming forth from the Father eternally, the, or rather, the Word, the uh, pre-incarnate and the eternal eternal Word coming forth from the Father. And of course, this Word would become fully incarnate in the womb of the Virgin Mary. The eternal would enter into time by taking our nature, taking our physicality of it, the, the Creator taking on creaturehood. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. To seek, to understand in the, that's in the, the prelude of the Gospel of John, the first chapter of John. To seek to understand his prayer through what his witnesses proclaim to us in the Gospel is to approach the Holy Lord Jesus as Moses approached the burning bush. So that this image of uh, the burning bush uh, used as the it's a, a contemplative image. Uh, Gregory, I believe Gregory of Nyssa uses this in that. Uh, first to contemplate him in prayer, then to hear how he teaches us to pray, and maybe it's the other way around, in order to know how he hears our prayer. So Jesus prays. And they said, well, why would Jesus pray? If Jesus is God incarnate, why would he pray? Why wouldn't he just talk to himself? Well, God is one, absolutely one, in essence and substance and being and in nature and in purpose and all that. But God is also truly three. Distinct, not separate, absolutely united, but distinct as three, and with uh, distinct infinite and eternal personalities, which is why, you know, the Father's the Father of the Trinity, and, uh, the, the, and why the Son uh, be, was the one who became incarnate, and why the Holy Spirit's the one who is in the background, uh, illuminating. So, according to their personality, that's the way I see it anyway. But, uh, so, but Jesus prays, and so, and this is quite proper. In fact, the, the 
greatest prayer would be the one who is God incarnate. So the, uh, the persons of the Trinity pray to each other, and they adore each other. So it's interesting the word pray, which in English originally meant to ask. So, you know, you might read Shakespeare or, or you know, the, uh, a uh, carpe diem poet of the 17th century, and they might say prithee, which is, I ask you, I ask, uh, I ask you, uh, I pray you, I pray thee, uh, asking that. So that's uh, presenting a question. And uh, so to pray is to ask. So we pray, ask each other to pray for each other. So we pray to each other, asking us to pray with us to God, to, to the Father through the Son, our one mediator in the power of the Spirit. And we ask the saints in heaven, to, so we say pray for us. And there are some who see, you know, if you, the, if you use the word pray, uh, invoke, or anything, that's adoration. No, that's not adoration. That's just participating in the family. That's just asking for prayer. And they say, well, uh, wouldn't these saints have to be omniscient, know everything, and omnipresent to do this? No. Because they're they're not restricted by our mortal life, by uh, like I can't. I'm in this room. I don't really know what's happening outside this room, uh, and I am in one place at one time, uh, as discombobulated as I may be. I'm in one place at one time. But once you're you're beyond the barrier of this mortal life, when you're dead lunch thing, physically dead, uh, you're not bound by that. You're not bound by time and space the way we are. How, what, what uh, uh, limitations there are, I don't know. There's certainly still limitations of creaturehood. But just like angels can be, you know, all over at once, uh, the, uh, all over the earth. And remember, the earth is just this tiny speck in the universe. It's, that's not a big thing. And you can imagine that. I can imagine listening to every single person on earth and perfectly comprehending what the person's saying uh, at once. Can I do it? No. But I can comprehend, I can imagine doing that uh, in, in this way. And, and you can too. So uh, this is not an exercise in omniscience or uh, omni omnipresence uh, in, in, uh, for the saints praying for us. The, you know, for, uh, but uh, it's this unity in Christ Jesus. This is it's, it being. This is the full exercise of the Holy Spirit, and we uh, to do it according to our limitations. Now, praying for each other, and asking others to pray for us. Yes, praying to other people, and not just praying to people who've gone before us. But pray, uh, praying to people here, asking them to pray for us, to pray with us. A priest I know, when everyone would ask him, you know, someone he hadn't seen in church in a long while, and he said, oh, Father, pray for me. And he said, oh, certainly. He said, but God loves to hear from strangers. Why don't you pray for yourself? Why don't you, you ask prayers yourself? Uh, why, why don't you just talk directly to God? Is what, so we should always do that. We should always... Pray, talk directly to God, but we should always ask everybody to pray for us, especially those close to him, the saints, the saints in heaven. So Jesus prays, and this is 2599. The Son of God, who became Son of the Virgin, also learned to pray according to his human heart. So he learned, he learned how to pray. You might remember learning how to pray as a child. So I learned uh, from the radio. I learned with Cardinal Cushing, the uh, Our Father and the Hail Mary, because we listened to the radio when I was really young, Cardinal Cushing on the radio doing the rosary. And uh, so I can still hear his voice, Holy Mary, Mother of God. I can still hear Cardinal Cushing's voice in uh, the rosary on the radio. And so I learned that. No, did I know what the, these word, these prayers meant? Uh, not completely. And I and did I even get them right? No, it was holy. 
Hail Mary full of grapes, the Lord is a tree. And, and that's what I did. Uh, that's what I thought. Our Father, too, I got that sort of mixed up. Our Father, who art in heaven, Howard in heaven, Harold be thy name. Deliver us from eagles. Oh, that's, um, but anyway, I knew it was prayer. And I knew we were talking to God. And I knew I was asking Mary to pray for us and with us. I knew that. As young as I was under the age of five, uh, having these prayers, uh, I knew that. And so, and you may have stories of learning to pray. One of my favorite uh, statues or, or pictures of St. Anne is of St. Anne teaching Mary to pray uh, there or teaching, you know, she has a scroll and she's pointing to it. You know, the, the commandments of the scriptures teaching her uh, that. So, um, so Jesus learned to pray. Jesus, we always must realize Jesus is fully human and he emptied himself of his glory, the, the kenosis that St. Paul talks about. So he, while he still, he is totally united in his human nature to the divine nature, he has a, a true human nature. So, and he embraced ignorance, he embraced all of that that we go through. Because, you know, on the cross, he wasn't experiencing the beatific vision in his, uh, in his suffering. He experiencing real suffering, re real doubt, real all this other stuff that we go through, real ignorances, all the things that we have uh, in his human nature. He had to learn. He had to learn in his human nature. Yes, in his divine nature, he knew everything. His divine person, all that omniscient, omnipresent, all the omnis. Uh, but in his humanity, he learned. He was restricted before his uh, resurrection in his humanity in many, so many ways. Uh, but this was what he willingly embraced for our sake. He wasn't play acting. He really went through our whole full human condition. So we had to learn. So we learned, learned how to pray. So I'm to a Mary and Joseph teaching him the... Uh, the, the Barakot, the blessings, Baruch Atoah Zanai teaching that and reciting that, you know, reciting their uh, grace before meals, their blessing of the bread and the blessing of the wine and all this and the food. They're, since Mary and Joseph were very devout Jewish people. And so he learns the formula of prayer from his mother and also from St. Joseph and probably from uh, other people, other relatives, St. Anne and uh, these other people uh, in his life, uh, the, who, uh, you know, whoever uh, that were there, uh, this, this, this was a part of their community and culture. And it's very sad now that often we have lost that. I, as a child, I was still in this Christendom, where I, a Christian community. We used to play church all the time. Everybody went to church or synagogue or whatever. And if people didn't go, they didn't tell people. They were ashamed of it, or at least didn't want other people to know. Uh, but that, so that's, uh, uh, but and you know, on Sunday morning, you just follow the crowd. They would go to the different churches there. And so, uh, of course, Saturday would be the synagogue, which was sort of on the other side of Somerville there. On, well, not the other side, going almost into East Somerville there on Central Street. But uh, all of this, uh, but uh, now, no. You know, it's, it, and the culture, people don't, children don't play church. You know, often children aren't taught prayers by their parents at all. The, the, you know, uh, I remember I was amazed the first funeral I had uh, in which uh, when I started the Our Father, no one, no one answered it. The pe there were people who just didn't know it. And I was sort of shocked by that because I thought, well, everybody knows this. Well, they didn't. So we should really uh, teach, you know, if you have children, you have grandchildren, all of that, teach them the prayers. And you can do that by reciting it all, reciting it over and over and over. You say, well, isn't that parroting a prayer? Well, no, because even when I didn't really know what I was saying, I intended that as prayer. And then I got to learn what it meant. And at the Our Father is so profound, and we're going to have a whole section on the Our Father. 
uh, here on each of the, the phrases of the Our Father here in the Catechism. Uh, and uh, I believe in also this prayer section that is uh, part of that. Uh, because that, the, it's rightly called the Lord's Prayer. Although in some way, the what Jesus prayed at the Last Supper is even more the Lord's Prayer, his high priestly prayer. And so we are to recite that, we're to repeat that, and even more so to use each uh, section of it sort of as a as a, a an instruction in a, a particular way of praying, which a, a particular thing to pray for, and other things. So anyway, he learns the formulas of prayer from the people around him, from his mother who kept in her heart and meditated upon all the great things done by the Almighty, as uh, in, in Luke, Luke uh, the three there, um, and. He learns to pray in the words and rhythms of the prayer of the people in the synagogue at Nazareth and in the temple at Jerusalem. Jesus is Jewish, not just was Jewish, he is Jewish. And so his prayer was Jewish. And so, and we, as people, Gentile people, grafted on to the cultivated olive, to use St. Paul's image, uh, we should appreciate our Jewish heritage of, of, of prayer, the Psalms and all the other things that were taken from the synagogue uh, that we have, so uh, that uh, to really appreciate that. And so, and at the temple of Jerusalem, going up, the, the family would go up, up to, uh, up to Jerusalem for the feast, varied feasts, and uh, Jesus gets lost at one point. I always think of it as you know, the, the men and the women were separate. So Jesus was at that age where he could have been with the men or he could have been with the children and, and, the, uh, and, the, and his mother, the women. and Because uh, the women usually would be, would be in the center sort of the caravan. The men would be around in case it was attacked or whatever. And uh, so they're gone a day and then they get together and uh, I almost hear them say, I thought he was with you, I thought he was with you. So they go back and there he is teaching in the temple. Uh, with that in the temple. So, and the temple is so important to Jesus. He's going there all the time. He teaches there. He worships there in, in the temple. You know, with, uh, I envision there there at the, the afternoon prayer, the evening prayer, where the incense is, is poured out and uh, the great clouds of smoke are coming up out of that uh, there in that, which he calls my father's house. And when he was there at 12 years old, and uh, they found him. And it's interesting, Mary says, you and your father, your father and I. And so because Jesus, Joseph is a true father to, to Jesus. An adoptive father is a true father. The true father to a child is the one who puts out for him, the one who care, truly cares for the child, not just the begetter. So, uh, so... Uh, but his prayer springs from an otherwise secret source. As he intimates at the age of 12, I must be in my father's house. Or as some translators say, I must be about my father's business. I must be in my father's house. Here the newness of prayer and the fullness of time begins to be revealed his filial prayer, his prayer as son, his unique relationship with the father as God as the only begotten. And uh, so he prays this filial prayer, which the father awaits from his children. So this prayer of coming to God that we uh, talk, call him Abba, Daddy, God the Father, uh, that we're sons and daughters, the beloved sons and daughters. We're not just servants of God. We're certainly not slaves of God. We're servants of God but our service is the service of love. It's the service of a devoted son or daughter that we have uh, there to God. And our prayer should be that we should have intimate, close prayer with God the Father as well as formal prayer. And it's a, 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 there's a prayer books. I'm just often so moved by prayer books, especially the beautiful poetry of prayer. Or oh, this thought is, oh, I wish I thought of that that this saint thought of it, that this author of this prayer thought of it, this liturgical prayer uh, presents. So it's our prayer 
the prayer, the literature is our prayer. It's not just something belonging to professional prayers, uh, monks or nuns or, or those, but it belongs to all of us. And it's a good habit to uh, acquaint yourself with the liturgy of the church, morning prayer, evening prayer. There are uh, things that you can get uh, that have it uh, cut down, uh, like uh, Magnificat, that thing they have morning and evening prayer uh, uh, trimmed down uh, uh, with that, and meditations in the Mass and stuff like that. That's a nice uh, little book for that. But, or you can get uh, uh, the Liturgy of the Hours itself. They have it there. They, this was the Daughters of St. Paul. I think they're still publishing it of the uh, condensed Liturgy of It doesn't have everything in it. It doesn't have the office of readings and stuff like that in that. Or you can get a little morning and evening prayer thing that, have, or Compline, there, there are little booklets that just have Compline, that's night prayer for, for that, and various other other things, other ways of doing that, the, the, the office of the church. In, uh, and the different rites of the church are, are often just very beautiful. So, anyway, so we, we turn to the Father as our beloved Father because he has turned to us as his beloved children through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the filial prayer is finally going to be lived out by the only Son in his humanity with and for men, for humanity. So Jesus is the summation of humanity. He's eternally God. He's not a part of God. He's not, you know, part God. He's fully God, as is true of the, the Holy Spirit and the Father. But he's fully human. And so he represents us in prayer. And so this is lived out, this filial, this sonship, this filial relationship to God the Father. This sonship is lived out by Jesus for and with us all. So 2600. The Gospel according to St. Luke emphasizes the action of the Holy Spirit and the meaning of prayer in Christ's ministry. So uh, Luke emphasized the Holy Spirit, not just in the Gospel of Luke, but also, and perhaps even more so, in the book of Acts. And the meaning of prayer in Christ's ministry. Jesus prays before the decisive moments of his mission. And that's something we should do. A good, before we do anything, we can pray. Or at least it's just think in our mind, in, I'm doing this in the name of God. I'm doing this for the glory of God. I'm doing this. And uh, when we think of that, often that will uh, hold us back from doing things we know are not for the glory of God or are not good. And uh, will help that propel us through knowing that what we're doing is right, even if it won't be all, uh, uh, particularly applauded by others. And, uh, and, and the Arab world, there's, uh, both among Christians and Muslims and Jews, uh, there's a custom of saying, Bismallah, Bismallah, forgive my pronunciation, of, uh, in the name of God, that you do all of this stuff in the name of God, everything. And also to say, Alhamdulillah, praise the Lord, uh, and all this stuff. And also, Inshallah, and, uh, God willing, that, we, that I want to do God's will. So if this, I want to do this, but if it really isn't God's will, then let this not be done. Or if I, do, I don't want to do it, and God does want me to do it, may I do it. So... Jesus prays before the decisive moments of his mission, before the Father's witness to him during his baptism, and then uh, after you know, he prays, and the transfiguration, before his own fulfillment of the Father's plan of love, his passion, he prays so deeply there at the Last Supper, the Mystical Supper. Uh, and it's a very uh, personal prayer. We almost feel as if we're eavesdropping when we're uh, listening to his prayer. He prays before the decisive moments involving the mission of the apostles and his election and call of the twelve, before Peter's confession of him 
as Christ of God, and again that the faith of the chief of the apostles may not fail when tempted. Jesus' prayer before the events of salvation that the Father has asked him to fulfill is a humble and trusting commitment of his human will to the loving will of the Father. 2601. He was praying in a certain place, and when he had ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. That's in Luke 11, 1. And so he, and then he gives the Our Father there. So we should always seek from Jesus teaching in prayer, because he's the, the great master of prayer. And we can learn from others who are masters of prayer, who have learned from Jesus. And the Holy Spirit teaching us to pray, interceding within us. Praying with unspeakable groans, as St. Paul says. In seeing the Master at prayer, the disciple of Christ also wants to pray. By contemplating and hearing the Son, the Master of prayer, the children learn to pray to the Father. And that's uh, uh, one of the benefits of coming together in church to pray at Mass and in other forms of liturgical prayer and then uh, uh, group prayer that's private, is that it, it draws us to pray, Lord, draw in, in to pray, praying with others there. So Jesus often draws apart to pray in solitude. So that's a good thing. It's a good thing to have. It's, for some people, it's hard to get, you know, if you have children, little children, it's often hard to get a spot of solitude. Uh, but it's it, it, good to work on that. Work on a little, a minute here, a minute there, if you need to. But if you can, to set aside a little chunk of time, according to your ability at that. If you're just starting out, you know, don't say, oh, I'm going to be, you know, three hours. No, uh, a little, and then work at it may increase in time, that, especially as your yearning for prayer grows. You'll want to do that more and more. St. Teresa of Avila's father, who used to come and visit her all the time, and uh, and so, in, you know, and she wanted to pray a lot more. When he really got into praying, and she taught him to pray in many ways. He didn't come as often because he would be praying. He said, yeah, I wanted to spend my time, you know, by retirement time, so to speak, in prayer. Uh, more in prayer as time went on. Because he got more and more used to that. So, and he prays on a mountain, often at night. Some people find a, a great thing to pray at night and all that. Uh, I usually don't, I have to admit it. I, I w like to pray the most when I have energy. And uh, yes, I pray at night. I pray before I go to bed. And often if I wake up at night, I'll pray. As often that happens, I'll be awake. I can't go back to sleep. So I said, oh, well, I might as well pray now. Talk to God. Uh, uh, doing that, th those things. Uh, but uh, pray, I like to pray often when I'm at my my top of uh, energy and things like that. Nighttime, I'm definitely not at the top of the energy. Often I'm tired. That I, uh, you know, I'm not fully human early in the morning or in the middle of the afternoon. Or sometimes I haven't figured out when I actually am fully human. But the Lord is there, and we don't have to make reservations with God to pray. You just pray. You don't have to do it out loud. You can do it in your head. It doesn't have to be formal prayer. It doesn't have to be say, "Oh, I have to." The only prayer that the Father will that God, Father will listen to is the Our Father. No, pray those prayers. Pray those prayers that you've learned, and uh, over and over, do those frequently. Because sometimes you know your mind is just a blank, so it's good to and pray with the prayer book. Prayer books are helpful. Pray with scripture. Pray the Psalms, as we were just talking about. Uh, pray these other things. The Lord. Jesus includes all men in his prayer, all men, women, children, all humanity in his prayer. But he has taken on humanity in his incarnation. So he, he's a particular human. He has a particular DNA, went to a, you know, a particular family, a particular culture, a particular time, a particular place, partic particular, particular, particular. But he's also someone who's taken on all of humanity in himself. He is ha anthropos, the human being for us. 
He's Theanthropos, God who's become a human being. So, and he offers his prayer to the Father, and he offers the people of all of humanity incarnation, when he offers himself to the Father. Jesus, the Word, who has become flesh. shares by his human prayer in all that his brethren, the, 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 his fellow humans, experience. He sympathizes with their weaknesses in order to free them. So in, in Hebrews, the letter of Hebrews tells us that we do not have a high priest who is not able to sympathize with us. Jesus totally sympathizes, totally emphasize, empathizes with us in everything. That we go, even, you know, even that we fall into sin, he he sympathizes with it, even though he never fell into sin, but he knows temptation, and he, I believe, is the most tempted human that ever was, and may, and his mother Mary probably the second, uh, because uh, the devil wasn't going to go, the devil was going to try to get him. He didn't. The devil didn't just tempt him there in the desert at that time. I'm sure he went all the way through. Uh, trying to get him in any situation. Trying to snare his humanness. So it was for this that the Father sent him. His words and works are the visible manifestation of his prayer in secret. And we'll go on with 2603 uh, next week. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so let's see who's here with us today. Lynn McCarthy. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Timothy Mills there in, by the monastery in Redwood Valley, California. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Eileen Rainey from my, uh, my parish long ago in Brockton. Christ is risen. Nope. Oh, not say that now because the time has passed. Easter tide has passed. Unless, well, even if you're old calendar, if you're Greek calendar, the, uh, it's ascension tide for them. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Kimberly Smith. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Father Paul Ring. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Robert Hart. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Dylan King Eubank. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Mary Nigerian. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Adam Bernica Sr., Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Uh, Father Martin Charlesworth, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Kate O'Neill, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. So have a wonderful day, and let's continue to pray for each other and uh, with each other and uh, united in Christ, in this mystical body of Christ. Bye now.